Welcome again to the Academy on Computers. This time, graphics. We're going to look at the graphic and animation capabilities of several microcomputers and talk to three guests who, for various reasons, are involved in computer graphics. And this is in the picture, our resident expert, Jim Butterfield. Jim? Yes, Jack. Tonight we're going to look at a number of microcomputers and the way they implement graphics. There's quite a variety of ways in which graphics are placed on small computers. Some of them are much more elaborate than others. And it's important to know the differences when you're choosing a microcomputer. For example, you can sometimes buy a simple computer and add on graphic features, but it's always well to know what their basic capabilities are. All right, Jim, but is there any rule I can follow, such as paying more for a computer or, or buying extra RAM to get better graphics? Well, there's no general rule, although the question of RAM is probably a good one. If you're going to have very detailed information on the screen of your computer, you're going to need a great deal of storage to store that picture in your computer, and therefore you'll be looking for a computer that has a good deal of RAM on it. Beyond that, I don't think there are any general rules. What happens is that various computer manufacturers organize or design their machines according to the markets that they're trying to appeal to. Now, if you're building a computer for home use with games and entertainment, you'll lay a lot of em emphasis on graphics and probably sound as well. On the other hand, if you're producing a computer for word processing and serious business uses, place less emphasis on graphics and perhaps look to more uh, simple and straightforward applications. So there's no general rule. Different people go different ways. In fact, that's one of the questions why it's difficult to transport program between different computers because graphics is done in a different style in a different way on almost every computer, and therefore programs with graphics often transport very poorly from one computer to another. So the area of graphics is one that contributes to the compatibility problem of software. That's right. All right. I, I'm curious about the way the graphics get on the screen. I mean, you, you can type the characters in, mm -hmm. and you can load them in. I mean, a, a prearranged program, a specific one with graphs and charts and so on. And you could uh, use a peripheral, such as, uh, you know, a graphic board for, for drawing and so on. Are there any other ones? Well, you can also use extra commands that are implemented in your language. A language such as BASIC might have extra graphics commands added to it. And this will allow you to do things like drawing straight lines, circles, plotting points on the screen, and things like that, if you have them. I should point out that there are two general classes of graphics that you're likely to put on a computer. First of all, we have the chart charts, the business forms, the diagrams, the graphs, the pie charts, all of those sort of things. And the second thing is we have the pictures, the sketches, the diagrams, the illustrations. Those are two quite different things, and we achieve them in different ways. It's probably a little like the difference between painting the Mona Lisa and painting your house. I think we should point out that the computer has a rather mathematical nature, and when it's doing a bar graph or a pie chart, it's very much in its element, and it can give you a lot of help in drawing those sort of things. On the other hand, if you, what you want to do is to sketch a lovely picture, a sunset, or perhaps a portrait of somebody, then you'd look for something which isn't quite mathematical at all, a peripheral such as, for example, a graphics tablet or a light pen, something like that. All right, but I do have quite a choice. Yes, you do. All right. Jim, could we see on the machines we have in the studio the kind of things I do with them? Yes, I have uh, a set of machines here which can show the various kind of graphics you may be able to implement. First of all, I should emphasize, Jack, that you don't need to have special graphics capability in order to draw, draw graphic charts. The ordinary alphabet will do you for many simple business purposes. For example, here is a simple basic program to draw a graph of a series of numbers that we find in the data statement there. When we run this program, it uses conventional characters, in this case asterisks, to draw a little a little graph of sales over a number of years. I'll type in run, and here is our little bar graph. You can see the years here and the, the details of it. That is to say, you can do graphs without any special high-resolution graphics capability at all. But very often, for detailed effects and animation, you'll want to go into more detail. This was uh, done on the Osborne mm -hmm. computer, which doesn't have any particularly unusual graphics, in it, but it can be done on any computer. They'll all do this. When we go to special features, however, we can show, for example, the Texas Instruments TI-99 computer. Now, the way we make this one work is we change the graphics that we have already in the machine. For example, we have the letter A, the letter B, the letter C, and so on. We can change those to anything we want. For example, up here, and I won't give you a course on programming now, but we have call character 67 and draw it this way. 
Now, what I've done is I've chosen the alphabetic letter C. You call it a character. You call it a I'm, I'm, I'm saying, throw away the old C. I'm right. going to draw my own letter okay. C. So when I run this particular program and say, let's go, it will redefine the letter C. Let me run this program, R, U, N, there's the enter key, and now it's all ready to go. I've changed the letter C for something new. Let me type a bit of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and you'll notice if you look closely at the screen that the A and the B are okay, but the C looks like a little man now. I've redrawn that character, and that's a very common way that we do high-resolution graphics. We redraw characters, not so often the alphabet, but other ones. Now, if you take a character which is specially drawn, you can then use it on the screen as a little animated device. And in fact, if you want to, it's very easy to swap this character for a slightly different one and have motion happen in there. For example, we can take this little man here, and by defining a few more characters and putting it on the screen, we can make the little man do a dance there. I'm sure you can see this little chorus line we have going. <laughs> and that's very simple. That's three characters. One the man standing, the other one kicking, the other one kicking, the other one. Little this straw happy thing. Uh, well, we haven't quite worked that in. We've made a little more animation there to do that. But that's a very common thing that we do on many computers. Redefine the characters and then use them in a special way. I'd like to draw your attention to something a little bit different which is going on here. On this machine, a Radio Shack TRS-80, We this is a... TRS-80 color computer. We well, have a different screen, too. Huh? Well, yeah, this is a television set and not a monitor, and so the picture itself will not be as sharp as what we've seen right. elsewhere. Now here, rather than talking about the graphics itself, I'm talking about the language. The basic language has been expanded so that if we want to draw a circle, which would be quite a complex job for us to do if we had to do all the mathematics and decide where all of the little dots or pixels had to be placed, now all we have to do in the basic command is give the command circle, say how big it is and where we want to put it and what color we want it to be and automatically the language has all the math you need to draw a circle on the screen. Let's say run R-U-N and you'll see the circle drawn up that way. You can consider we'd have to do quite a bit of job if we had to work out the mathematics to plot every one of those single points that would go together in basic. to make a circle. That's in basic. It's an extension to the basic language. You'll often find this where machines have graphic capabilities. They'll also have add-on capabilities to basic that let you draw or animate certain things to help you do these things. Circles, line, boxes, and so on. Let's move on to this particular machine. We have a Commodore 64, and what we have over here is a thing which is sometimes called a sprite, it's sometimes called a movable object block, and it's sometimes called a player missile graphic. But whatever it is, it's an interesting new aspect of graphic that appeared fairly recently on the microcomputer scene. We can see, by the way, here, we have a large detailed drawing mm -hmm. of the small uh, maple leaf that we have over on the right-hand side. And in fact, that's how we drew it. We can work on this great big board here, and the small movable object will be drawn as we work on this big chart. Now, once we've drawn it, it has a very interesting characteristic. It's almost as if it has a life of its own on the screen. We can set it in motion, if I can hit the right combination of keys, and you can see it can move smoothly around the screen. Well, that seems pretty simple. Hit one key, or two there? Just well, yes, there's a program in yeah. here that's right. moving it for me. Uh, that's not built into the hardware of the machine, but it will move very simply around the, around the screen. All you have to do is to say where you want it to be, and it will be there. But that's probably not the most interesting thing about the sprite type of animation. Let me stop the program. Yes. Can yeah. you control of the movement, too? Uh, well, this one is it's a random movement that the right. program is doing. I could speed it up, but I think this is a fairly nice speed yeah. for what we're doing here. Let me stop the program for a moment. The spider is still on the screen, but the program has stopped running. I have caused a break in the program. Now, this is a very big program, <laughs> and when I list it, you don't need to read the whole thing, but I'd like to point out that as the listing goes by, the clock stays on the screen independently. It's an independent thing. It's almost as if it was an extra layer laid on top of the screen. I'll stop that list. You can see that the spike just, now the, the printing goes by underneath and doesn't seem to be affected at all by the spike. In fact, I can continue this program with a continue command, and the spike keeps moving. As you can see, it's moving over top of a whole separate plane on the screen. How, how could you use You can move it over that other screen. Mm -hmm. You can be superimposed. How would you use that in, in, uh, in the program? Well, suppose we had some text on the screen in an educational program, and you wanted something to point out the verb in a sentence. You could have a big hand, move right out, over top of whatever's on there, point at the verb, and then move right back on. We can do this thing for various sorts of errors and various sorts of animation. But the nice thing is, as it's moving by, 
if you're moving, say, a little airplane past some scenery, as it goes by the scenery, as you can see, the material that's behind disappears. This makes it very easy to program this kind of effect. A pointing device, a game device, all kinds of things. It's very popular in games, mm -hmm. of course, because of the easy motion that we can get out of these things. Jim, is what we've seen here representative of the capabilities uh, of the present microcomputers? Well, the techniques that we've seen are common to many computers, but probably if we wanted to be complete, we should mention, for example, the shape tables, which is used by the Apple. We should mention the raster tables, which are used by the Atari. There's quite a few things. One thing that's rather unusual in the way that graphics are used today is a system called the Apple Lisa, which is used as a special form of business graphics. We'll take a look at that at another time, Jack. Thanks very much, Jim. Jim and I will be back with our guests and more about graphics right after this. Here's a message for registrants in the Computer Academy. Please fill in your answer sheet for questions 10 to 18 in the Correspondence Connection, Part 4 of your Participant's Guide, and mail your responses to us in the envelope provided. Also, if you were unable to return your answers to questions 1 to 9 a few weeks ago, you may send them back in the same envelope. With us in the studio are three people you must be Tori Hansen, an educator and consultant, Peggy Perry, a business systems specialist, and Cam McMillan, a student animator. Tori and Jim, over to you. Terry, uh, I'd like you to tell me, why do you think graphics are important in education? We see people learning in different styles, Jim, uh, and in terms of uh, sequence of learning, people first learn concretely, and we as adults learn abstractly. However, during that process, there's a bridge that takes us from the concrete to the abstract, and that's called a pictorial uh, section, and I think that's where computer graphics are, are very strong. Okay, now you say computer graphics. Don't ordinary graphics do that? Couldn't I draw something on a blackboard or hang it from a string in a, in a classroom and do the same thing? Well, you know, Jim, the problem with things that are hanging from the board or, or looking just pasted on the board, they lack that dynamism, that, that animation, or at least that suggestion of animation mm -hmm. that I think computer graphics can give us, and they lack that, that contrasting color from the dark background to the light foreground. Okay, now, Tully, I see you have a Texas Instrument TI-99 yeah. here. And you have a program under. Would you tell us a bit about this program? Yeah, the program please? is Logo, and this section of Logo is called a Sprite. No, just a moment. The language is Logo. Well, right. we'll yes. Okay, the program is written in Logo. Yes. Okay. You're gonna, we're okay. going to run into a conversation here whether Logo is a language or not. Yep, okay. Now, mm -hmm. part of the language of Logo, deals this PI, mm -hmm. deals with something called Sprite. Mm -hmm. And what the Sprites do is it gives us some primitives, some trucks, some balls, some rockets. Mm -hmm. And what the learner can do is simply play with velocity and direction on them. Mm -hmm. But what it does also is it allows the learner to program themselves. For instance, here we have on the screen, you can see that there are some cars and some trucks moving. However, how about doing something ourselves? Okay. So here I have a grid as I've turned it onto the, the programming mode, and that's why it's in the green color. What I have to do now is I have to bring the cursor down. Okay, now this is an enlargement of the truck. Yes, this is an enlargement of the truck. Okay, and you're going to change it because there's something else on Okay, we have a tow truck. Okay. Now. Okay, and, and there we have the tow truck right on the I screen. I can see the hook on the back of that. Yes. Okay, are there some kind of educational subjects that aren't helped by graphics where probably you shouldn't do graphic things? I don't think there are any educational subjects that shouldn't have graphics. I think there are some that lend themselves better to graphics. But you can even do some tactical, uh, grammatical formations and poetry using graphics because we know as learners there are certain things that we have to hook in on. And because we all learn differently, there are things that we want to make sure that all the clients can hook in on in terms of learning. Okay, you have color here. Is color important or is black and white really just as good? I think because graphics want to um, reflect the real world to mm -hmm. us, we, and the real world is colorful, uh, that's the only way to do with graphics. I think you lose a great deal in graphics in black and white. Is there a particular age at which graphics are good? There, I think, yes, yeah, graphics are good at any age if you want to get your point across because, again, we're trying to hit different types of learners. Mm -hmm. But children who are not reading yet in terms of this kind of a program, if you can give the instructions in graphic form, then I think that's another power for it. Now, suppose you want to use graphics in the classroom today. What would you advise people who are thinking of this to look at? Or any, anything they should keep in mind? Yeah, two things. I think a high-resolution screen is very mm -hmm. important. And the second thing is 
to perhaps explore other ways of keying in information. A keyboard is fine, but it's very traditional. We can also have a, a graphics tablet or a joystick. I think that could be equally successful, except the manufacturers are not yet putting out the kind of hardware that I think is, is good for the at least educational environment. So things are still changing. Yes, oh, for sure. Okay, thank you very much, Tori. Yes. We've looked at a classroom use of graphics. Now I'd like to turn to a business use and see graphics in activity there. Peggy, how are you? Hi, fine. I see that you have a IBM computer here. Yes. And I gather you use this computer for business purposes in your own office. Yes, I do. Very good. Now, what you have on the screen right now looks to me like a spreadsheet. I don't see too many graphics there. Oh, no. This particular package combines both graphics and uh, spreadsheet capabilities so that a uh, businessman could build uh, a set of numbers and then produce graphs from it. You can produce that from that? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, this is used the data from the spreadsheet that I showed you before and produced the graph from it. Now, uh, why is that important to do in the business world? Uh, it's very important primarily because it shortens down the amount of time required to do some analysis and make a decision. Uh, normally, if you're faced with a table of numbers, um, you require, your brain must organize the numbers and put a pattern on it. Mm -hmm. With graphics, that's already done for you, so you don't have to worry. You can go proceed to your analysis. So in the business world, the picture is worth a thousand words? Oh, very significant. Okay, good. You have a bar graph here. Can you also draw other kinds of graphs, like a line graph or other things? Yes. Good. Could you show us an example? Here's a line graph with the same information. Okay, good. Did you write this program? No, I didn't. I purchased it. You purchased it, but you put the data in yourself. So it's That's your data. Right. And you feel ready-made packages are very good for this kind of thing. Very useful. Uh, saves a lot of development costs and time. Very good. Is color important here? I see you've been using two colors. Is that important, or could you just do it in black and white? Uh, you could do it in black and white, but I think color really brings the information out and, and looks a lot better to the eye. Okay, now, if you have something like this, some people say color is still a bit of a waste of time because, after all, you can't put color on a printer, can you? No, you can't put color on a printer, but you can put it on a plotter, and there are plotters available for this device that are within reasonable cost. Do you use the plotter? Yes, I do. Very good. And so you, you actually draw out on pieces of paper charts like this. Yes. Do you have any examples of that? Mm -hmm. There are a couple. Is this a lot of work? Yes, this uh, takes quite a bit of time to produce. Um, to get the intensity of color requires about 30 minutes for this graph. Do you have to work for 30 minutes? No, the plotter does. It's worse for the computer, not for you. Yes. <laughs> okay, very good. So it takes about 30 minutes for one of those. Right. Uh, do you have any other example? Mm-hmm. Here's the pie chart. Okay, does that take 30 minutes? No, that's much faster because it uh, doesn't require the solid color and also um, it's only one color. It doesn't have to fill in the solid color there. Right. Do you find that other people, uh, not, you use this in your own work? Oh, yes, I do. Every day? Every day. Uh, you draw yourself graphs every day? Every day. Do you do graphs for other people? Yes, I do. Uh, what happens? Do they run in there and say, hey, would you draw me a graph? It's happened. <laughs> Has that happened? Yes, I've had people come out of meetings, ask me mm -hmm. to produce a graph, and then walk back in with them right away. Uh, so they want a graph really on the right basis? Yes. And you can do it? Yes. So you don't need any special program? What you have is good enough? For what I have is good enough. Okay, now as well as doing it on pieces of paper as you've shown it, can you do it for overhead transparencies and things like that? It will do overhead transparencies. Um, the only thing it probably won't do that you would want would be slides. Okay, now why... Couldn't you just do as well, though, to take this out to to a, a, a art studio or graphic studio, and they could do that for you? They could do it for me. Um, the difference is a uh, forty-eight hour turnaround in a in a shop as opposed to thirty minutes for myself. Do you find that you play around with graphs more because it's just right there and you can do it? Yes, easy? I do, and it's making that much of a difference in my company too. Other people are starting to pick up and use graphics much more than they did. You sort of make you more effective. Very much so. Okay, thank you, Peggy. We've seen a business application of the computer, and now we'd like to turn to a graphics kind of an operation. Cam, how are you? Fine, how are you? Very good. Uh, Cam, I'd like to ask you, uh, you're a student at Sheridan College, are you not? That's right. And you study graphics there? That's right, I'm in my last year. You're in your last year. And you're using graphics on computers now as part of your curriculum. Uh, that's right. I think it, it facilitates turning things and uh, viewing them in different ways than I could do with any other thing. Now, this is a kind yeah. of, not just graphics, but it's animation. You can make things move as well. That's right. It's so easy to do. Is, is this 
quite new. People used to do it by drawing hundreds of guys. Uh, this is almost brand new, and I've been using it quite a lot to, to uh, very good use. I see. How, how do the animators feel about this? Do they you feel very threatened by it. <laughs> those that don't know about it. That's right. Uh, they can't cope with it. Uh -huh. I see you have something on the screen now. It looks like a camera on a tripod. Is that right? Uh, that's right. I can do anything I w I'd like with this. I can okay. connect it inside the computer and I can take any angle on it. Okay, good. Then right. can we move in on the camera? Let's let's go for a yeah. close up here. And while we're doing that, maybe I should uh, ask you a few other questions. Now, can you go off screen a bit and I can lower it back down so you can see it head oh, on? Okay. Right, you need to keep a little bit higher there. That's right. Okay, good. As you can see, this is a 3D program. Mm -hmm. Now, what we have drawn on the screen of this computer, uh, how, how is it drawn? It's drawn in points that I've drawn uh, in an editing table. Mm -hmm. that I can flash back to any time I'd like. Okay, and, and how long did it take you to draw all of these points? There they are. This is the editing table. Is that all of them? Uh, no, there's quite a lot, actually. It must take you hours to put those things in. They go on and on and on. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, back to the okay. picture. Here we go. Okay, now, I always like those things at the beginning of Newsreel where the camera rotates into you and you're looking into the lens. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. I'll try to do something like that. Yeah. Okay, here it comes. It down. takes a long time to regenerate these images. That's the only problem. Okay, very good. Why, why is this good for animators? Why is it so important for animation people? It's very hard to uh, turn things that are solid by hand. Mm -hmm. You have to do it with perspective points, and it takes a long time. And, and this will do it automatically. It does it all for you. That's right. And I can zoom in on this. Mm -hmm. And take it in my way. Yeah. As it gets closer, uh, you get better resolution as well. Yes, I can see it sharper. And the parts of the picture just disappear off the edge. They don't fit in there. So we're okay. looking right down the lens right now. Okay, okay. I've looked at many computers. I haven't had too many of them looking back at me. Mm -hmm. uh, this kind of an animation thing, I suppose that, that when you were doing it for real, you, you could speed it up. It's not terribly fast right now. I use a 60 millimeter camera and I film off the screen. And so the results are very smooth when you do that. So then you have a speed it up motion when it goes to the... That's right. Yeah. I see. Okay. Very good. If you have this kind of a package, I, I suppose this is much too professional for people to use this at home. This would be expensive enough. No, this is a very cheap program, actually. Really? Yes. And uh, I'd recommend it for anybody who's interested at all, because it, it doesn't take very long to learn. It looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, it is. You know, I think kids would like this as well. Are there any other uses you'd make out of, uh, out of a package like this besides simply animating something? Or, or uh, Architects could use it to design uh, buildings, or uh, industrial designers can use it to design anything they'd like. Okay, last question, Cam. How long did it take you to plot all of the points to draw that camera? It took me about 30 hours. So. <laughs> 30 hours? Okay. You call it time saving? Well, I can do it faster now. Okay. I've done it once. Very good. Thank you, Cam. Yes, Cam, thank you. And thanks, Peggy and Tori. And Jim and I will be back to answer your questions right after this. Next on Bits and Bites, computer music. Billy Van and Lubagoy will not only play music, but play with music. We'll see how the synthesizer chip in a computer generate sound waves and see that even those of us with a tin ear can compose music. That's the next edition of Bits and Bites. And following it, Jack Lisley will be back with Jim Butterfield and guests for further exploration. Computer music on Bits and Bites, followed by the Academy with Jack Lisley. All right, Jim, from the mail and the phone, since our last program, we have these questions. I know it's been done before, but I'd like Jim to go over the data terminology one more time. Can you describe database, files, records, and fields? Yes, I have a uh, filing cabinet here to try to show the ideas behind database and so on. The total information we have in here is a group of related information called a database. It's all about the equipment used here on the Academy. Now, if I open up this database and I look inside, what we have in here are a group of files. Each one has to do with certain parts of information, part on computers, part on printers, and so on. You can see the different files. They're all interrelated to make a database, but each one is a collection of information called a file. Let's take a file out of that database, one collection of information of a certain kind, and let's open it up and see what we have inside. Inside this particular file, we have a collection of information. Each sheet is about a certain computer. Each sheet is a record. So in here now, in the file, we have a number of records. If you wanted to find out a certain computer, Commodore 64, 
the VIC-20, the Apple II Plus, you would find a particular record that gave you that information. Let's take it a little bit further. On one record, we have details about this computer. We have the computer name, its power supply, its size, its color, uh, the information on its display, on its keyboard, and on its disk drive, which it can use. This information, then, each element is called a record of information. Now, that's as far as our information goes. We can put it back together again and say, when you collect a large number of little bits of information, each little piece of information called a field, all about one thing, that thing is called a record. It's like a student record or anything like that. When you put a group of student records together, or a bunch of records together, so that you have information on a class or a school full of people, or computers, you have a file. When you put several files together, which are related on the same subject, and you collect them together, that you call a database. And that's how it all works. Fields, the records, the files, the database. That's right. Thank you, Jim. My computer is supposed to have 64K of memory, but when I turn the power on, I get only about 39,000 bytes free. Is there a problem? No, there's no problem. The message that you get telling you how many bytes free says how many bytes is available to your basic program. The whole 64K is still there, and you can still use it, but very often, sometimes basic doesn't need it all, and in other cases, parts of it may be taken away as work areas. If you read up on the information, you'll find that the whole thing is there. It's simply 39K for basic is probably quite a bit for the average user. All right, here's a question on DOS. Mm -hmm. Leaving the theory to one side, what do I need to know about DOS when buying a system? Probably about three things, Jack. First of all, if you're going to use a disk, you have to have a DOS because that's where you have the logic to say how your disk is to be handled, where information is to be written, <laughs> and so forth. So you need one if you're going to have a disk. Secondly, many DOS systems take up space in memory. So if you have a large DOS system, and you should ask about these things, you may need extra RAM to accommodate the extra memory space you need. Thirdly, before you bring your DOS into the memory of the computer, guess where it is? It's on disk, and so your DOS system will take up a certain part of disk. So you should probably ask when somebody says, how big a disk is, you say, yes, and after you take out the amount for DOS, how much do I have left? You should know that part of it, too. Now, fundamentally, these are the things you need to know. You've got to have one. It'll probably take up space in RAM, probably take up space in disk. I should notice that a very few systems have DOS built into ROM, and those kind of systems, then, you don't need to consider these considerations. Thank you very much, Jim. That's all the time we have now. Next time, computer music and speech. Jack Lindsley with Jim Butterfield inviting you to join us then on the Academy.